What is going on everybody? You can call me Heroes 3 Guy, and in this video I am going to be ranking the level 7 units in Heroes 3 Horn of the Abyss. Now this video is going to be lengthy. I am going to go into a lot of detail. I'm going to break down each one of these units and thoroughly explain why I rank these guys where I rank them. Uh, this video is going to start off by going over uh, some criteria. Uh, the general criteria and guidelines that I'm using uh, to rank these guys. And then I'm going to just take these guys in alphabetical order here, and I'm going to do an overview, kind of an in-depth overview for each creature. I will have timestamps in the description below uh, for each one of these guys. And then after I've done somewhat of an overview uh, for each of those guys, I'm going to go ahead and get into the task of ranking them first through 12th. Um, and before I get too much into it, guys, likes, comment subscriptions uh link below uh for channel memberships 99 cents a month there's also a link in there for a paypal uh, donation if you guys feel so inclined it would mean a lot to me uh but as far as the kind of the important notes and the criteria the first thing i want you guys to be aware of is that this is a ranking list first through 12th this is not a tier list there are not going to be any creatures that share the same rank we're going to do the nitty-gritty painstaking task of giving them their own specific slot first through 12th. Uh, the other important note is that we are only ranking the upgraded units. We will somewhat factor in the unupgraded counterparts when ranking the upgraded versions, uh, but just going to include the upgraded units. Uh, there are no neutral units in this, so there's none of the uh, you know fairy, crystal, rust, or azuri dragons. It is just the uh, level 7 units that belong to each of the 11 factions. And we do actually have 12 units in this video because, of course, the most recent faction, Factory, has two level 7 units. The other important point is that I am ranking these guys in a player versus AI game. So this is not ranking them based off of a player versus player game. It is a player going against the computer. Big, big important note there. Uh, and then also we are ranking these guys as if the player has these units, not if you're going against these units. I mean, there are a number of units out there who I would love to go against because I can exploit them, but they also would be great to be in my army because I can make the most out of them and vice versa. Um, and then the last important note is that these guys are under the control of an experienced player. Uh, there are units in this game that, you know, for a new player, they're pretty straightforward. It's hard not to get the most out of them. There's not a whole lot a good player can do that a bad player can't with certain units. However, there are also a number of units that I would say have a pretty low floor, um, but they also do have an extremely high ceiling if they're under the control of an experienced player who can get the most out of them. Um, so let's go ahead and get on in to doing a brief overview over each one of these units. The first unit we're going to go over is the Ancient Behemoth of the Stronghold faction. So if we take a look at our list here, they have 19 attack and 19 defense. They come in 10th place for both of those. They are tied for 10th place with the Ghost Dragon for attack, and they hold the 10th place rank all by themselves with that 19 defense there. As far as damage goes, they hit for a minimum of 30, a maximum of 50 for an average damage of 40, putting them in 7th place compared to their peers. As far as hit points go, it's as good as it gets. All of these guys either have 200, 250, or 300. Ancient Behemoths have the 300. That is quite nice. Their speed is on the slow side compared to uh, its peers. Uh, they're only faster than the Chaos Hydra and the Juggernaut. Uh, I will say nine speed in general isn't that bad. You know, if you go down one level of creature to the level six creatures, you know, you think of uh, Dread Knights, Champions, War Unicorns. You don't really think of them as being slow. Well, they all three have nine speed as well. Um, and uh, also, Ancient Behemoths are a two hex creature, so they do get that um, that extra hex head start, if you will, compared to let's say a Magic Elemental with nine speed. They're just a one hex, so they'd actually would be able to travel one hex less in a straight line than an ancient behemoth. So that definitely helps. And I mean, the quickest units in, uh, you know, for the level six have what, 13 speed with the Ifrit Sultans. Um, Wyvern Monarchs and Scorpicors have 11. So 
these guys are only slower than three of the level six units. So you can still get around the map pretty well, um, but still relative to their peers, it is on the slow side. Uh, as When it comes to growth, they are standard here to growth, tied with everyone except for the Phoenixes who are in a class of their own there at three growth. Uh, cost 3,000 gold and one crystal. That is as cheap as it gets to be 3,000 gold and one precious resource. Uh, tied for first place along with the Ghost Dragon and the Phoenix. Very, very affordable. I will also say uh, getting their dwelling, the Behemoth Craig, is quite easy. You can oftentimes get it in the first, if not the second week. It is cheap, has very few prerequisites to get it. Um, it's easy to get them and get their, their growth growing. That is also very nice. And I will say, especially in uh, Horn of the Abyss now, that the Cyclops Cave no longer costs that absurd 20 crystal. Instead, it costs 20 ore to get the original uh, Cyclops Cave. That definitely frees up some of your crystal as well uh, to uh, not only get the Behemoth Craig, but also get the units. Um, so yeah, great on cost, and uh, it's easy to get and start accruing the, the creatures themselves from the dwelling. Um, as far as special abilities go, they ignore 80% of target's defense. That is an insanely good skill, guys. Uh, so just to kind of explain to you guys how this works, you first have to know what attack and what defense does. So each unit has their own base attack and defense stats. For instance, Ancient Behemoths have 19 of each. Um, and then if they're under the control of a hero, whatever the hero's attack and defense stats are, add on top of the creature's base stack. So if you're a hero with six attack and six defense, well, you'd have Ancient Behemoths who have the equivalent of 25 attack and defense. And if you attack a unit and you have more attack skill than their defense skill, your damage will get increased by 5% for each attack skill over the defender's skill or their uh, defender's defense skill. And there is a cap on it. 300%, which means you have to have a 60 points difference to get that maximum 300% bonus to your base damage there. Um, and then as far as the defense skill goes, if you get attacked by a unit and you have more defense skill than that uh, unit's attack skill, they will hit at reduced damage, 2.5% uh, for each point that your defense is higher than their attack. There is a cap on that as well of up to 70%, which means you just need 28 more defense than their attack to get that uh, maximum defense, uh, you know, damage reduction. Um, and then the very cool thing about this special ability, very, very important thing to notice here is that this special ability scales into the late game. So the more attack and defense that you obtain on your hero, and then of course that the enemies attain on their heroes. Um, so just to kind of demonstrate, uh, let's say you have 20 attack going against 20 defense. Well, for an ancient behemoth, it would be 20 attack going against now four defense you uh because you're taking 80 percent of that 20 away leaving you with four so now there is a 16 point discrepancy you're now hitting at an 80 percent increase to base damage and then let's say that uh now all the heroes have another 10 of their primary stats so now it's 30 attack going against 30 defense well now that becomes your 30 attack going against six defense because that uh you know 80 percent ignoring 80 percent of 30 uh attack gives you it brings it down to six so that's 24 you will now be hitting at 120 percent increase the damage and then as more attack and defense is accrued on it, heroes you now have the 50 attack going against 50 defense well now that becomes 50 attack going against 10 defense a 40 point discrepancy you are now hitting at 200 percent base damage it is a very very nice special ability that scales into the late game and quite frankly these guys can slap they can touch like no other unit in the game. That is an incredibly, incredibly nice special ability. Um, so just kind of to go over it again, my friends. Um, yeah, you can say their attack is low, but when they're ignoring a bunch of defense, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and then when you say see their damage here, 30 to 50, it's not bad. It's, you know, you know, middle of the pack, a little below average here at that 40 average damage. But again, when you are hitting with so much increased bonus to your base damage, it really, really mitigates their average damage. Um, and then, yes, they do have pretty low defense here, but at least you can say they have 300 hit points to somewhat offset that. Not bad. Uh, again, they are as cheap as, they as these guys get. Uh, they're very easy to obtain early and let grow. 
Um, the only real hang up on them, you could say, is their speed. They don't fly against most of these peers here. Most level seven units, you could say, are speedy flying units. These are one of four uh, kind of the walking, lumbering, slower units. So the only real hang up here, I'd say, guys, is the speed. So the ability, special ability offsets the low attack and the average damage. The hit points does a pretty good job mitigating their low defense. Um, and the speed is the only, yeah, the only really thing that you could kind of get hung up on with the ancient behemoth here. The second unit we're going to talk about today is the Arch Devil of the Inferno faction. So we'll take a peek at the chart here. And as you can see, they have 26 attack, which is pretty darn good. They're coming in at fourth place. Uh, they have great defense at 28. Uh, they're coming in second place, only behind the Archangel, who has 30. Uh, then we get on over into the damage. They hit for 30 to 40 uh, for an average damage of 35. That is the lowest average damage compared to their peers. So as far as average damage goes... It is as low as it gets compared to their peers, uh, so not ideal there. And then also, they do have the low end 200 hit points. So again, these guys can have the 200, 250, or 300. They got the bottom of the barrel. Not great, my friends. Uh, when it comes to speed, they are great. They are great there. So the quickest on this list, of course, is the Phoenix with 21. Uh, they have a big lead compared to their peers, but then they're only slower than the Archangel, who has one more speed than them. So very, very good speed. Growth is standard, too. Uh, as far as cost goes, they are quite costly. They come in 10th place. They are only slightly more affordable than the Titan and the Archangel. And um, to be candid, they're a little overpriced. Uh, not only the cost per Archdevil for what you get, in my opinion, uh, but also the faction itself is pretty expensive. The, uh, the Forsaken Palace, the, the dwelling you need to get to recruit Archdevils, uh, has a lot of prerequisites that require a lot of precious resources, a variety of precious resources. Um, the Forsaken Palace costs, it's expensive. It's an expensive building uh, for both the base and the upgrade, and it has a lot of prerequisites, not ideal, and then they're pretty expensive for what you get. Um, as far as their special abilities, they have some very, very good special abilities. So you look here, they are teleporting, which is fly. There's really no difference between teleporting and fly. They can move over obstacles, over castle walls. They are essentially a flying unit with great speed. So that is very, very nice. Um, and then they have no enemy retaliation, which is a extremely good skill. It's not an uncommon special ability. A lot of units have it. Uh, almost every faction has at least one unit with this special ability. Um, I think, yeah, Inferno may have the most with two, because Cerebri, the level three unit, has no enemy retaliation as well. Um, but it's very nice. It, it, that definitely helps make them a little bit more tanky, if you will. So they don't have to worry about taking retaliatory attacks, which is very nice because they do just have that 200 hit points. So that does somewhat offset their squishiness. And then if you look here, they do minus two to enemy luck. It used to just be minus one to enemy luck, but in Horn of the Abyss, not only did they make it minus two to enemy luck, but they incorporated unlucky. So now uh, in the original game, you could only have zero luck or positive luck. Now you can have negative luck. So of course, if you look at luck, if you get lucky, you will double your base damage. If you get unlucky before an attack, it will have your base damage. You will hit for 50% of your base damage. And if you look here, of course, if you have zero luck going on, there's not going to be anything going on as far as getting lucky or unlucky. Um, but if you have minus one luck, it's a one in 12 or 8.3%, but minus two to luck, that is a 16.7% chance. It's like an aura that they admit for the entire enemy units, uh, enemy, uh, enemy team now has a 16.7, a 1 in 6 chance to hit for half base damage. That is very nice, a very nice aura. And the very cool thing about it is that even if the Archdevils die, that aura remains. Uh, so you could, even if you you know don't have to worry about a morale penalty or anything, you could just throw one Archdevil into a spot in your army if you have room and it's not throwing off your morale. And then so what if they die in the very first round? Now the rest of that battle, you are crippling their luck by two. That's very nice. 
Um, so it can, at the very least, it can maybe uh, decrease the chance of them getting lucky, neutralize any positive luck, and especially when you're going in uh, you know, neutral battles, things like that. That can be a bit, pretty big game changer in big battles with a lot of rounds here. It can definitely be felt in battle. Uh, very nice special ability there. And then they hate angels. Uh, you know, so they hit for you know 50% increase to base damage whenever they attack an angel. So instead of hitting 100% base damage, they're always going to be hitting them with 150% base damage. Nothing crazy. You know, devils or you know angels hate devils too. So you could say it equals itself out. Uh, nothing too crazy there. Um, but as far as things go here, uh, yeah, they have great attack, like it's 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 up there. Uh, but then they also have the lowest average damage, so it's like, eh, okay. And then they have great defense up there at 28. Uh, they're second place there, but then, eh, they do have the 200 hit points. But you can say the no enemy retaliation is somewhat of a defense mechanism. Um, and then. Uh, you look at speed, the speed is really good. That is great, guys, especially to be a flying unit, to be that quick. That is great. Uh, cost, though. Cost is not great. And so when you look at, you know, subpar health, you know, low average damage, despite having great stats here, they are a little overpriced, uh, despite the no enemy retaliation, despite the minus two enemy luck. Um, good unit, just a little overpriced, and they definitely have some uh, some holes in their game, if you will. The third unit we're going to talk about today is the Archangel of the Castle faction. So if we take a look at our list here, they have 30 attack and 30 defense. They are outright in first place in both of those categories. That is very nice, my friends. If we take a look here at damage, they are also in first place. However, they are tied with the Titan for 50 average damage. Archangels, of course, hitting 50 to 50, very consistent. Uh, Titans hit for 40 to 60, a little bit higher ceiling, lower floor. They average 50 damage as well. So first place for the first three stats. Then we get on over into hit points. They aren't in first place, but at least they aren't in last. They don't have the 300, but at least they don't have the 200. They're right there in the middle at 250 hit points. Not bad. And then their speed is phenomenal. They are second only to the fastest unit in the game here, Phoenixes. They're actually the third fastest unit in the game. Azuri Dragons have the 19 speed, so extremely fast as well. They were the fastest units in the game prior to the uh, Armageddon's Blade expansion. Um, so very, very good speed. Their growth too, standard here with everyone else besides, of course, the Phoenix. Uh, their cost, eh, they are as expensive as it gets, they are the most expensive. They're in 12th place here, my friends. Not only do they cost 5,000 gold a piece, but they are the only unit here to cost three of a precious resource, and in this case, gems. So very, very expensive. Um, getting on over to their special abilities, uh, they do fly, which is great, especially with their speed. Very, very good. Um, they hate devils. You know what? Devils hate them. It kind of equals itself out. They hit each other uh, for an extra 50% to base damage, so they hit for 150 damage instead of 100% damage uh, to each other. So nothing too crazy there. Uh, however, their resurrection ability is very, very good, especially if you know how to use it. So it functions just like the spell resurrection. Uh, so it can only be used, of course, on allied units that are able to be resurrected. Um, and for each stack of archangels that you have, they can use it once per battle. And for each archangel in the stack, they can resurrect, or they will resurrect, an equivalent of 100 hit points per archangel. Um, and what's really, really cool about this is that you can clone an archangel. So whether or not the Archangel you're cloning has used their Resurrection or not, the clone is always then going to have their one cast of Resurrection. And this can really, really, really come in handy, especially in Horn of the Abyss, where you have bigger maps. You know, you have the huge, extra huge, and giant maps uh, where you're more likely to have ridiculous amounts of army strength, where you're having hundreds, if not sometimes thousands of you know level seven units in your army and when army strength gets too high it'll get to a point where even the most powerful uh hero who casts resurrection is just going to be a drop in the bucket you know the amount of troops you're going to be losing uh because of just the sheer numbers of army strength you're not really going to be able to resurrect a good 
percentage of your army after a big battle like that with such high army strength. But if you have archangels, they will be able to resurrect massive numbers of troops so you can you know, mitigate essentially all your losses if you play it right. So you're in a big battle, a lot of losses are being had. Let's say you blind uh, the enemy unit's last stack. You can do this strategy where you clone the archangels, you have that clone use its resurrection, Next round, you cast some sort of AoE spell, whether it's Meteor Shower, Fireball, Frost Ring, whatever, probably your lowest spell point costing spell. You then kill your own clone, and then the next round, cast clone again, have that new clone use their resurrection, and then the round after that, kill the clone again with a Fireball or a Frost Ring, and you repeat that over and over and over again. It is very, very nice. Very, very nice special ability there. Uh, it really helps mitigate losses at all stages of the game. Excellent, excellent, excellent special ability there. Uh, and then also, they have plus one morale to their team. That is very nice. Um, and what's cool about it is just like the Archdevil's minus two enemy luck, the effect lasts even after the Archangels die. So if you put one Archangel in your army and they die the very first round, you will still, your whole team will still get that plus one morale for the remainder of the battle. So a very nice, just kind of a, a aura, a nice buff that they provide to their team. It really helps too, uh, if you're mixing factions, uh, you won't get as bad of a morale penalty. They definitely kind of mitigate that uh, when it comes to morale. So very cool there. And just a little overview, my friends, you know, first attack, first defense, tied for first damage, middle of the road hit points, like still solid you know, second place speed, uh, great special abilities, speedy flying, very expensive, not only cost per each, but the portal of glory is not cheap. 10 of each precious resource, I believe for both the upgraded and upgraded version, a lot of prerequisites, but I will say guys, unlike the arch devil, I think you get what you pay for here. There is a reason that they are the most expensive unit in the game or on this list. The fourth unit we're going to talk about today is the Black Dragon of the Dungeon Faction. So we're going to take a look at our list here, and they have 25 attack and 25 defense. That is above average. They're in fifth place when it comes to attack. They are in fourth place when it comes to defense. Very solid, my friends. As far as damage goes, they are in third place. They hit for a minimum 40, maximum 50 for an average damage of 45, and that is actually the second best as far as average damage. Uh, They're only behind the Titan and the Archangel, so very solid damage compared to their peers. They do have 300 hit points. That is the top that any of these guys can have. And what's really neat, one thing to point out, is that Black Dragons are the only flying unit on this list that have that high end hit points of 300. Very nice. They're the only speedy flying unit with 300, but getting over to speed, it is 15. I would still consider them a speedy flying unit, but they are fifth. There are a number of units on this list, flying units on this list that are quicker than them, but solid speed. Um, you know, you may want to watch putting them all the way in a one bottom corner. They may not be able to hit the unit all the way in the opposite corner, but still they can pretty much move the entirety of the map. Solid speed, uh, growth, pretty standard there at two, uh, tied with everyone else besides, of course, the Phoenix. And then cost, they're pretty standard. Sixth place, they're right there in the middle. Uh, they're not cheap, they're not expensive. Uh, you know, 4,000 gold and two of a precious resource. It's a very common common uh, uh, cost that you see here. Pretty fair price, all things considered. And then we get into their special abilities. Well, they are dragon type, uh, which doesn't mean a whole lot. You know, if you come here, uh, they get affected by Mutar, Mutar Drake special ability, where all dragons receive plus five attack and defense. Um, of course, if you have the artifact Vial of Dragon Blood, it gives all dragons under their control plus five attack, plus five defense. And as you can see, here are all of the dragons in the game uh, that would share these same buffs. And then, of course, you know, Slayer can be cast on a unit, which gives them you know, extra attack against dragons. And depending on the level of Slayer you have, it can also be against, you know, you know, Hydras, Haspids, and things like that. Um, so nothing too crazy there when it comes to their dragon type. 
Um, and then, of course, like I said, they are flying. That is very, very nice. Moving over obstacles, castle walls, things like that. And then they do have a breath attack, which can be a double-edged sword, uh, but a good player is going to make this work in their favor often, and it's going to be rare that it ever comes back to bite them. It's going to be rare, very, very rare, that you're going to attack a unit and then, oops, accidentally hit one of your own units. And while it's more common, uh, but really not that common for a good player, uh, to put their breath attack units in a spot to where an enemy unit can attack them, they can then draw out a retaliatory attack, which will then go through them and then hit one of your guys behind them. So you have to kind of watch where you position them because you don't want their retaliatory attack to, you know, go through and, uh, you know, hit one of your own guys. But it's it the pros outweigh the cons, especially for a good player. It's not very often that it comes back to bite you. So this is all in all a very nice special ability. It's not an uncommon special ability. Uh, there are a number of units on this list that also have it, but still very good. Um, and then they have magic immunity. I don't like it. I don't like it, guys. I really don't. Again, if you look at the criteria of this list, it's, you know, going against the AI. It's, um, you know, a, under the control of a good player, as if these guys are on your own team, a good player is going to want to cast its own buffs on its guys more so than it wants to avoid the debuffs and damaging spells of an enemy unit. I mean, I feel like I can do more with my good spells than what I'm avoiding, uh, you know, with their magic immunity from enemy heroes spells. You know, I want to be able to resurrect these guys. You know, I've had plenty of games in the past in my, you know, almost 25 years of playing this game where they just kind of dwindle down and I have the spell resurrection. You know, I have expert earth magic. I'm able to resurrect all my other troops, you know, blind the last guy. Um, but my Black Dragons just kind of seem to get dwindled down. And there's been plenty of games, if I'm remembering right, I think when I played Kill the Gods Hell Mode, I think it was that map, where a huge chunk of the game, I played with Red Dragons. Because Red Dragons, I think, are what, immune to 1 through 3. And so, of course, Resurrection being a level 4 spell, I was able to resurrect Red Dragons. And had I upgraded them to Black Dragons... I would have lost a huge chunk of them, and I think they would have become obsolete and would have been worth replacing in my army um, had I not been able to resurrect them. It's it's really annoying. I'd like to be able to you know bless these guys, you know buff these guys, shield these guys. Um, I, I I trust my ability to buff them more than I'm worried about an enemy debuffing them. And I know you can get the orb of vulnerability. It's not the most common artifact. It's not uncommon to get in a lot of playthroughs, and you know. 95% of the time, if I have the Orb of Vulnerability and I have Black Dragons, I want that Orb of Vulnerability on. I would prefer this ability to go away. I wish they weren't magic immune uh, as far as me having Black Dragons in my army. I find it annoying. You can get the Orb of Vulnerability. Of course, it takes up an artifact slot, uh, but all things considered, I'm not really a fan of it. and I think a good player would prefer not to have it. Um, and then, of course, the last thing they have here, just kind of like how the Archdevils hate the Archangels and vice versa, um, the uh, Black Dragons hate the Titans. So they will hit Titans for 150% damage. So 50% increase to base damage whenever they hit Titans. Um, so all things considered, looking back, these are very solid units here. They have very solid attack and defense. Top tier damage there, 45, the second average damage you can get. The only speedy flying unit in this on this list with 300 hit points. Solid speed there. Solid cost. You got some really solid special abilities here. Uh, the breath attack's great. The magic immunity definitely irks me a little bit. But these guys are very, very well-rounded and pretty tanky for the role they play as a speedy flying unit. All in all, a very, very good unit. The fifth unit we're going to talk about today, my friends, is the Chaos Hydra of the Fortress faction. So we'll get on over to our list. They have 18 attack and 20 defense. That is not good. They are in last place, 12th place when it comes to attack with 18. And then they have 20 defense. So they do have more defense than, you know, the Phoenix, the Ghost Dragon, and the Ancient Behemoth. But all in all, their attack and defense stats are not that good compared to their peers. Um, their damage is also bottom of the barrel, my friends. They are tied 
uh, for ninth place. Last, they average 35 damage. Uh, that is as low as the average damage gets. Uh, so they do have a really low floor at 40 or 25, but they do have a, you know, a pretty high ceiling at 45. A bless would go quite a long ways in bringing out the most in these guys. Uh, water magic in general brings out the most in these guys, but that is something I'll get to here shortly. Uh, so, you know, last place, last place, bottom of the barrel. Uh, we come on over to hit points and hey, they don't have 200 hit points. At least they got the 250. We're kind of getting away from that bottom of the barrel there. So that's solid. They got that going for them. But then we go to speed. They're back last place here. They have seven speed. They're tied for last along with the juggernaut. Not good. Uh, seven speed uh, is kind of like a Naga Queen. A Naga Queen is also another two hex kind of slithering, uh, slow, er, seven speed unit. Um, they have two growth standard on par with everyone else besides of course the phoenix and then cost they're pretty affordable uh they're not as cheap as these guys get the cheapest we see is three thousand gold and you know one precious resource these guys are just 500 more gold 3500 and one sulfur not bad um kind of like the ancient behemoths uh and their behemoth craig you can get a hydropond early compared to a lot of these guys uh you can get their dwelling early uh so you can you know Get them early, let them grow, uh, get them accumulating. They're pretty affordable, so at least they're not you know too expensive, even though their stats aren't great compared to their peers. Uh, and then we come on over to the special abilities, and they have no enemy retaliation. Uh, a very, very good special ability, uh, same as the Archdevil here. It's not an uncommon special ability. Most factions have at least one unit uh, with this special ability. Um, so, of course... I'm sure most of you know, um, you know, if you attack a unit, each unit typically gets one retaliatory attack per round. Some units can have extra. Uh, you can cast counter strikes. Some have unlimited retaliations. Well, Chaos Hydras, along with all other no enemy retaliation units, don't ever have to worry about a retaliatory attack. And then they also attack all adjacent enemies. That is a extremely nice ability, especially with no enemy retaliation. That is that is a nasty combination of special abilities very nice uh very unique you can say the magic elemental also has it but you know what the magic elemental is a one hex unit uh you'd be surprised uh you know how much more a chaos is attack all chaos hydras attack all adjacent enemies comes through as opposed to a magic elemental having that two hex unit just really opens up a lot more opportunities for this ability to shine um they could technically hit what eight if like there are perfectly eight one hex units surrounding them they could hit eight guys in one attack uh it's very nice um like i was saying earlier water magic definitely brings the best out of these guys if you get a a uh, bless that hits makes their damage pretty solid there they got that big range from 25 to 45 also water magic if you have expert uh teleport it just costs three spell points and you can teleport units over castle walls oftentimes your best choice is to position your chaos hiders in a spot where they could hit three sometimes even four units at once um very very nice i mean when you're hitting consistently hitting multiple units at once with no enemy retaliation oftentimes a chaos hydra despite their low attack and defense can dish out the most damage in a battle um, if you know how to use these guys uh, they're not as bad as they look on paper. So again, you look back, uh, you know, terrible attack, uh, terrible speed, last place there, lowest average damage, bottom of the barrel defense, 250 spell points uh, or uh, hit points. All right, at least they're affordable, but their special abilities when in the right hands can be absolutely devastating. So um, a little underrated in my opinion. Uh, they're very unique, but when played with right, these guys can be devastating. The sixth unit we are going to talk about today is the Crimson Coatl of the Factory Faction. So this is one of two level seven units that the Factory Faction has. And at the time of recording this, the Factory Faction has officially been released for about six months. Uh, so we get to go over uh, the first factory unit here guys um, if we look at their attack and defense they have 21 of each so it is bottom of the barrel my friends eighth place for attack seventh place for defense 
not that great, definitely below average. And then we come on over to their damage. They are also lacking there as well. They have they are tied for the lowest average damage at 35. Uh, same as the Chaos Hydra. They have a low floor, but a pretty high ceiling as well. A big range there, 25 to 45 hit points. It's as low as it gets. Not looking great so far. Uh, their speed, they're a speedy flying unit. Uh, 15, same as a Black Dragon. Not bad. Uh, you know, they're on the lower end for a speedy flying unit, uh, but middle of the road, uh, not bad speed there. Um, you may, again, not want to have them all the way in a corner. They may not be able to reach an enemy unit in the opposite corner, but they do a pretty good job getting around the battlefield. Uh, their growth is too standard compared to their peers besides the Phoenix. Uh, we come on over to the cost. They're like a Chaos Hydra. They are 3,501 one precious resource so they are just 500 more gold than as cheap as these guys can get so they are pretty affordable uh despite maybe not having the best stats you know as squishy as they get bottom attack defense bottom damage uh or bottom yeah, towards the bottom attack defense and then yeah lowest average damage um and then we look at their special abilities here like i said they are flying so that is great and then their special ability a new unique special ability is that they have meditation without skipping a turn so the unupgraded version of these guys the coaddle they have meditation but they have to skip a turn and what meditation does is if it's their turn in the lower right hand corner there will be a button where you can press to activate the meditation and if it's a coaddle and you click to meditate they kind of uh change their posture into like this meditation posture and they're invulnerable for the rest of the round, or they're invulnerable until their next action. Uh, so whenever their turn comes around next, they are invulnerable to uh, spells, to taking damage. You cannot damage them or cast spells on them at all. They're just immune to everything. They're invulnerable to everything. But when Coattles do it, they skip their turn. And they can do it once per, uh, per battle. Uh, now, Crimson Coattles, they can do that meditation, but it does not skip a turn. So what you can do if it's their turn... You can first thing, click that button, they make a little noise, and then they glow a little bit, and that means they're invulnerable, and they still have their action. You can still uh, move them around, have them attack. Uh, they won't be retaliated against because they are invulnerable, uh, but you can't cast spells on them either. You can't do any sort of buffing. So if you wanted to buff them, you'd want to buff them first, then cast their meditation, and then have them do their turn. It's very interesting. Um, I'd say I'd probably just take no enemy retaliation. It's just more consistent. It lasts the whole battle um, than this, but it is unique. It is cool. Um, you know, you can do some fun strategies with it. For instance, you you know, when it's their turn, you can cast Frenzy. You know, if you have Expert Frenzy, you'll take 200% of their defense stat and add it to the attack stat of them. But of course, their defense is reduced to zero. And so, in other words, they're very vulnerable, but if you cast meditation on them, they can go out there, hit really hard, and then when it's their next turn, their meditation, their invulnerability goes away, so does that frenzy. So that's kind of cool. It can allow you to maybe send them uh, behind enemy lines. Oftentimes, you don't want to you know, send them behind a castle wall to attack someone. Uh, they'll just get ganged up on if you don't have people or other units to uh, you know, give them support before the enemy units go. Uh, but you could just throw the meditation on them, send them out there, get a nice hit, and then perhaps the next round, if you're going before those units, you can just fly them back to safety. Uh, little things like that. Nothing crazy. Nothing crazy, but it is cool. It does have its moment to shine. You can, you know make it work to your advantage, you know, once per battle, uh, make something happen with it. I do like it. Uh, but all in all, looking back, uh, you know, they're towards the bottom of the barrel attack and defense. They're at the bottom average damage, bottom hit points for a speedy flying unit. It's not great, not bad average. They are affordable. And then they got a decent special ability there. So just a, a pretty decent, nothing special unit, all things considered. The seventh unit we're going to talk about today is the Ghost Dragon of the Necropolis faction. So if we come on over to our list, they have 19 attack and 17 defense. It is not good. They're in 10th place 
when it comes to attack. They are only better than the Chaos Hydra and tied with the Ancient Behemoth. As far as defense goes, it is the worst there is. They're in 12th place at 17 defense, so not great there. Uh, we get into damage. They hit for 25 to 50. Uh, it's a pretty big range. They slightly edge out the worst average damage, so the worst average damage is 35. These guys have 37.5. They have a low floor, high ceiling. Uh, you know, they are undead, which is something I'll get to. So they can't be cursed, but yeah, you can't bless them either. Uh, so you just kind of have to rely on the luck of the draw here on that pretty big range of their damage. Uh, so not great. Um, hit points, as low as it gets, 200 hit points. Uh, so not looking good thus far. They have 14 speed, which isn't slow, uh, but they are the slowest of all the flying units. If you uh, look at these level 7 guys... Um, most of them are speedy flying units. Uh, you could throw them in that category. These guys are the slowest of the speedy flying units. So 14 speed leaves a little bit to be desired, but they you can still say they're speedy flying. So 14 speed, not bad. Seventh place there. Uh, growth, two on par with all these guys except the Phoenixes. Uh, they are as cheap as it gets. 3,000 gold and one mercury. So that helps a lot. That is nice. Uh, you know, and then we're going to come on over here special abilities of course they are dragon which we've been over you know there uh when we talked about the black dragon uh they get bonuses from mutar and mutar drake uh their specialty gives all dragons plus five attack and defense if you have the vial of dragon blood it gives all dragons under the hero's command plus five attack and defense um the spell slayer if it gets cast on someone you know they'll do bonus damage against dragons uh, so nothing too crazy there, but they also are undead. Um, so undead is uh, kind of a mixed bag, kind of a mixed bag. Um, can be good, can be bad, uh, but they have a lot of just natural immunities. So like I said, they can't be blessed, can't be cursed. Uh, you know, there's no death ripple, but there is animate or destroy undead. They can't be resurrected, but there is animate dead, uh, which animate dead is pretty nice. It's only a level three spell and you don't need to have... Uh, um, earth magic on your hero for its uh, for it to be permanent. Whereas with resurrection, if you don't have uh, earth magic, I think you have to have at least what advanced earth magic, maybe expert. I think it's advanced earth magic. Then the troops you recommend will be permanent, as opposed to just until the end of battle. Uh, so animate dead always lasts. So that's kind of cool. Uh, can't do sacrifice. All right. And then they are immune to mind spells. So they're avoiding Berserk, which is huge. Uh, although I will say that the Orb of Vulnerability does take away their Berserk. It also takes away their ability to uh, avoid hip being hypnotized. Um, same with Frenzy. If you have the Orb of Vulnerability on and you want to Frenzy one of your undead units, you can. Uh, but yeah, you can't blind them. You can't blind them. You typically can't Berserk them without the Orb of Vulnerability. Um, in Horn of the Abyss, they cannot be Forgetfulness, so that's going to be nice just for the Power Liches. Uh, you can't do Frenzy on them, man, unless you had Orb of Vulnerability. They can't be hypnotized. And then as far as morale goes, the undead are unaffected by morale. They cannot get good morale. They cannot get bad morale. So they're immune to mirth, which increases your morale, and immune to sorrow, which decreases your morale. Uh, they're also immune to a number of other things like the Ghost Dragon's aging ability, which we're going to get to in a second, uh, the Go uh, Zuri Dragon's fear aura, the uh, Lich's death cloud, uh, the Mighty Gorgon's death stare, uh, pit lords cannot summon demons from them. Uh, same thing, liches and power liches, death stare. The vampire lord's life drain doesn't work. Uh, the wyvern monarch's poison, and I'd imagine the haspid and sea serpent's poison as well, doesn't work on them. Uh, we'll get to that ability here in a bit when we talk about the haspids and, of course, the zombies' disease. Uh, Horn of the Abyss, its effects of raising fang arms doesn't work on undead. Um, and then, of course, we went over these two spells that only affects the undead. Um, and then the other thing is when you have, since they're unaffected by moral, if, uh, but if you have undead in your army, any of your units that are affected by moral, morale will have minus one morale. So not also when you mix factions, you of course get a morale penalty, but you'll get an extra one minus morale for mixing undead in your army. So, uh, you know, he here's a list of all the undead units in the game. It can be kind of tough to throw them in the mix with other factions. You have to have, probably have leadership or artifacts like the Pendant of Courage. Um, so eh, it can be a hit or miss here uh, uh, when it comes to undead. It kind of depends on the situation. 
uh, you're in uh, can, you know, it's a blessing and a curse, I guess you could say. Uh, and then, like I said, they are flying. That is great. Uh, and then they do minus one enemy morale. So it's kind of the opposite here of the Archangel, and it's a debuff similar to the Archdevils doing minus two enemy luck. So if you do need to mix in Undead with your army, at least if it's a Ghost Dragon, yeah, you're giving yourself that minus one morale for Undead, but at least you're giving minus one enemy morale to them as well, you could say. Um, and same thing, if you bring in one Ghost Dragon, you're giving them minus one morale, and even if that Ghost Dragon dies first round, they're going to still have that minus one morale for the rest of the battle. So that's a nice little debuff there. That definitely is cool, can come into play. Uh, that is neat. I will take that aura debuff. Uh, and then they have aging here, which if we get back, actually, we had it here, and I'll bring it up. But essentially what it is, is uh, they have, what is it, 20% chance? Yes, 20% chance to occur. So for units that are uh, not immune to it. So here's a list of creatures that are immune to it, you know, black dragons, uh, you know, the elementals, the undead, gargoyles, golems, mechanical units, which we'll get to here, a new class of unit introduced with the factory faction. Uh, so not all units, but most units can be affected by the aging. And essentially what happens is when you attack, there's a 20% chance to cast aging on them. It's like this twirling hourglass and their hit points are halved for three rounds. So if you attack an Azuri dragon for the next three rounds, each one of those Azuri Dragons, instead of having 1,000 hit points, are going to have 500 hit points. If you did it to Ancient Behemoths, for the next three rounds, each one of those Ancient Behemoths in that stack act as if they have 150 spell points as opposed to 300 spell points. Now, I believe it can be removed with uh, Cure and Dispel. Yes, it can only be removed with Cure and Dispel. Is Poison? Does Poison get Cure and Dispel, or is it just Cure? Anyways, um, I, I don't know, I'll have to look at that. Um, but, uh, yes, so... A little finicky. Uh, it, it can turn the, turn the tide of a battle. Uh, you could kind of divide your ghost dragons up into multiple stacks, or if you have space for them, or maybe you have you know 50 ghost dragons and you have two extra spots. Well, I'm going to put two one stacks of ghost dragons because they have their own chances to cast uh, you know aging. You can maybe take the retaliatory attack away, or have them take a retaliatory attack from strong biggest threat. Hope you can get off that aging attack and then focus on them while they're aged. Uh, it, it, it can be very nice, but it's not consistent. You can't rely around it. Uh, you can shoot for it, and if it works out, great. Uh, but it's not always going to pan out for you, but it can be very cool. Um, and it does actually stack with poison, which is an ability we'll talk about here in a bit when we get to haspids, but that, that'll be for another video. Um, you can essentially have a unit at quarter health uh, if you stack both of those abilities. Uh, so kind of going back over these guys, the ghost dragons here, they have not good attack. They have the worst defense. They slightly have above the worst average damage with the big min and big maximum range. They have the worst hit points you can have. They are the slowest of all the speedy flying units. Uh, you can say they're affordable. Great. They better be based upon all their stats. Uh, and then their special abilities, Dragon, Big Whoop, Undead, it, eh, it depends on the situation. Flying, that's good. It's cool they lower enemy morale. Yay. Uh, aging, it's a little inconsistent. All things considered, these guys leave a lot to be desired. They're not very reliable. They're very squishy. They don't hit very hard. They often mess with your own morale. Uh, and, it, you know, the minus one morale they're giving to the enemy, well, you have to deal with negative morale unless you're rolling around with all undead or perhaps undead and golems or undead and mechanical units or something. But more times than not, eh, and the aging is just inconsistent. All in all, these guys do leave a lot to be desired uh, being a level seven unit. The eighth unit we're going to talk about today is the gold dragon of the Rampart faction. So we're gonna go ahead and go on over to our list here. And if you look, they have very, very nice attack and defense stats, 27 of each. That puts them in third place for both attack and defense, looking good. We come on over to damage. They are also in third place, uh, only behind the Titan and the, and the uh, Archangel for average damage. They have that 45 average damage, very nice. Uh, their hit points, all right, 250. It's not the 200, but it's not the 300. 
solid hit points there. And then their speed is pretty darn good. They're in fourth place in speed. They're only slower than the Phoenix, the Archangel, and the Arch Devil. 16 speeds, solid. Uh, you can essentially put them anywhere on the map and still reach the opposite corner, get where you need to go. Uh, so very good speed. They're a speedy flying unit. Nice speed. Very solid thus far. Uh, we come on over to the cost, and it's pretty standard. It's pretty standard, 4,000 gold and two crystal. That's a pretty common cost when it comes to level seven units. Uh, so, so far they have you know great attack defense, great damage, solid hit points, great speed, priced well. Uh, things are looking good. We come on over to special abilities. So they are dragon type, and we went over this when we talked about the ghost dragon and the black dragon, you know, Mutar and Mutar Drake. Their specialty, you know, is plus five attack defense to all dragons in their army. Gold dragons will get that bonus. The vial of dragon blood, plus five attack and defense to all dragons. If you have that, gold dragons will receive that bonus. Of course, the spell Slayer increases attack value uh, when going against dragons. So there's that, not something you see too often. Um, and then, like I said, they are flying. So that, of course, is great, especially with their 16 speed. Very, very nice. And then we come on over to Breath Attack. And we also talked about this with the Black Dragon. It can be a double-edged sword, but a good player is going to take advantage of the breath attack and greatly, greatly reduce any of the times breath attack can come back and hit you in the face, literally. Um, so, of course, breath attack being you'll attack a unit and any unit, friend or foe, that is the hex behind them. Um, a good player is going to take advantage and utilize the ability to hit multiple troops at once uh, often. And a good player is also going to greatly reduce the chances and almost eliminate the chances, really, that you're going to accidentally hit one of your own troops. I mean, it's going to be extremely rare that an experienced player attacks through and hits a guy and then hits one of his own units. And it will be a little more common, but still uncommon, that you're going to position your dragons in a spot to where an enemy unit can attack them draw out a retaliatory attack that hits them and then one of your allied troops that happens to be beyond them. But all in all, I'd take breath attack on my units. Uh, it's, it's definitely going to be a pro way more than it's going to be a con. A uh, very nice special ability. And then they have immune to one through four spells. Ugh. I, that just, oh, I mean, guys, that bothers me so much. I cannot stand that special ability. It's terrible. Take it away. I mean, come on. Things are looking great. Attack defense, great. Damage, great. Hit points, solid. Solid, above average, great speed. Priced well. Flying. Breath attack. Immune to one through four level spells. Ugh. I mean, if we, if we juxtapose them here to the Black Dragon, and as I've already talked about the Black Dragon, I did not like their magic immunity. I, I dislike it. I was saying, you know, you can't resurrect them. I tr a good player should trust his ability to buff his units more than he fears an enemy unit to debuff and damage his units. I'd rather roll the dice that they can be affected by enemy unit spells and be able to cast my own spells. 95 times out of 100, I would prefer that not be there. I'd say 99% of times out of 100. Uh, you know, the full magic immunity, maybe 95% times out of 100, I'd prefer not to have it. But that is worse than full magic immunity. I mean, if you look here, they're uh, vulnerable to level 5 spells. Okay, let's go look at level 5 spells. So they can get hit by Titan's Thunderbolt, which of course is the artifact from the artifact Titan's Thunder. They can get hit by Implosion. That irks me. Huge. So they can get blasted with an Implosion, but you can't resurrect them. Urgh, I do not like that. So their uh, vulnerability to level 5 spells has done nothing for them. It's only hurt them when it comes to combat damage spells. And then we come to non-damage spells. Yay, you can cast a magic mirror on them. That's the only one. I mean, look, you have summon elementals here, and then you have sacrifice. Eh, whatever. You know, what, you can cast a magic mirror on them to give them a 40% chance to, you know, reflect that armor or that uh, implosion. I mean, come on. Uh, it's uh, The pros don't outweigh the cons by being vulnerable to level 5 spells as opposed to being uh, invulnerable to all spells. I definitely do not like that. I do get that, you know, you can, you know, when you play them with Rampart and you're using Rampart units, you can, you know, uh, war unicorns have that aura of magic resistance uh, where any unit adjacent to them gets 20% magic resistance. 
not the unicorns themselves, just units adjacent to them, and you can actually split them up into multiple stacks. And so if you had a gold dragon with uh, war unicorns on either side of it, they would be giving him 40% magic resistance, which of course could stack with whatever resistance you have through artifacts or you have uh, through the secondary skill resistance. And you could you know, look to stack some resistance on them, but you're not always going to be rolling with these guys with war unicorns. It just, ugh. It really, really irks me. It's the same complaints that I have about the Black Dragons magic community, but not. It's it's worse, which is mainly because you can get blasted with that implosion. Now, I will say, just like with the Black Dragon, you can get the Orb of Vulnerability, and you can greatly uh, and you can remove this, and you can then cast spells on it. But like I was saying with the Black Dragon, Orb of Vulnerability isn't the most common artifact. It's you know not super easy to obtain. It's obtainable, um, and I'd say. More than 95 times out of 100, if I had the Orb of Vulnerability and I have Gold Dragons, I'm going to be playing with the Orb of Vulnerability to take away that special ability. I trust my abilities to cast spells on them more than I'm fearing the spells of enemy heroes, and I hate that they can be implosioned and can't be resurrected. That just grinds my gears. So a, a big drawback there, but besides that, they were looking great. I mean, they were looking phenomenal until we got to that last special ability there. Uh, all things considered, they are just a very good unit with one big uh, you know, chink in the armor, so to speak. The ninth unit we're going to talk about today is the Haspid of the Cove faction. So we'll go back to our list here, and if you look... Their attack is great. They have 29 attack. That is just one less than first place. The Archangel there with 30. Then we go to their defense. It is at 20. That is eighth place. It's getting towards the bottom of the barrel. Uh, better than just you know three of its peers. Uh, so not great defense, but really good attack. Uh, we come on over to their damage. It's solid. It's very solid, 42 and a, uh, and a half average damage. They hit for as low as 30. They do have a nice ceiling there at 55. That's more than an Archangel. Uh, Bless could definitely go a long way to bring out their attack. Uh, but yeah, 42 and a half, that's solid sixth place. Uh, you know, all things uh, I'd say average, but they do have that high ceiling there with the 55. Uh, we come on over to their hit points. They are in that first place slot there with 300 hit points. That is very nice. They do have 12 speed, so you could throw them in the camp uh, of slow lumbering units. You know, you can put all the level 7 units in either speedy flying or slow and lumbering, you know, non-flying, ground walking, and slower. Of course, there are titans who are ranged kind of in their own camp, if you will. Uh, but 12 speed is not bad. That's more speed than a wyvern monarch. That's one more speed than also the Scorpicor. Uh, that's just one less speed than the Ifrit Sultan. I mean, these guys can move across the map in a straight line. Um, they are two hexes. They are a two-hex creature, so they do get that extra hex head start. Uh, so they could actually reach one hex further than a one hex unit with 12 speed. Uh, so for being a ground walking unit, 12 speed's pretty good, uh, all things considered. Although compared to their peers, which is what this video is about, they do come in at eighth place there. Uh, growth, uh, two standard besides the Phoenix with three. Uh, cost, pretty standard there. The 4,000 uh, gold and then two of a precious resource are uh, is a very common cost you see here for level seven units. Um, and then we get into their special abilities. So Poisonous is their first special ability, and it's not new to the Haspid. Uh, this special ability was also on the Wyvern Monarch, the level 6 upgraded creature in the Fortress faction. And essentially, if you look here, what it does is it acts very similar to Aging, the, uh, the Ghost Dragon special ability. Except these guys have a 30% chance, a pretty decent chance, better than 20, which is what the Aging is, uh, to poison it's uh the poison its enemy when it attacks it so essentially what it does is if you attack boom poison happens 10 percent of that unit's health is removed and when i say 10 percent, i mean the total health of that unit so let's say it's an ancient behemoth uh at 300 hit points per ancient behemoth if they are poisoned 10 percent of 300 is 30 so 300 minus 30, now all of those ancient behemoths for the rest of that round act as if they only have 270 hit points. 
And what happens is when you get poisoned, it lasts for three rounds. So then the next round, that round goes by the beginning of the next round, all the poisoned units, the little animation goes off and boom, beginning of that round. Now it's reduced by another 10%. So another 30. So they'll go from 270 to 240. So now it's minus 60 hit points. And then at it does it again. Then that whole round, they're acting as if they have 240 instead of 300 hit points. And then the third round comes, boom, another 10%. Now they're down to 210 hit points per Ancient Behemoth. Um, and what's really neat about this, unlike aging, so aging, 20% chance, boom, 50% of the uh, unit's health is taken. They're halved, essentially. It lasts for three rounds. At the end of the three rounds, they're back to normal. Poison stays. So at the end of the three rounds, they're no longer poisoned, but the maximum health remains decreased. Uh, it's very nice. And what's cool is they can be poisoned again and for another two rounds. So they can only, you can only get a maximum, uh, uh, poison can only reduce your health by up to 50%. So just five rounds of poisoning. And let's say you poison someone uh, with your attack and then one round goes by and it's like, all right, they have two more rounds of poison. Uh, and then you attack them again, and ooh, you poison them again. It can show the animation that you poisoned them again. It doesn't reset uh, the rounds to three. The three, the initial three rounds have to run their course. The poison has to go away, and then they have to get poisoned again uh, for another up to two rounds to happen. So the animation can keep showing, uh, but it won't reset the rounds if you poison an already poisoned stack. But the health decrease remains. So that is very nice. Uh, it can only be removed with the cure spell. Uh, Dispel does not remove uh, poison, so that is cool. Um, and uh, so if you think about it, in a really big battle uh, where a lot of rounds are going by, this special ability can be very, very nice. And which kind of leads me to their next special ability. The whole theme of these guys seems to be they are just menacing when it comes to big battles with lots of rounds and a lot of losses. And that is because they have a new special ability or a special ability that is unique to the Haspid. And essentially, it's called, it's called Revenge. And essentially what it is, is an injured Haspid stack fights slightly better. So as Haspids die, uh, the, their, their damage is increased. So their losses, I guess, aren't felt as much when it comes to uh, damage. So if you look, there's kind of an elaborate uh, equation here. It's the number of Haspids at the beginning of battle plus one times one Haspid health, I guess divided by total health now, plus one Haspid, minus one times 100%. So yeah, essentially, as Haspids start to die, uh, their damage increases. So the more that die across, they get they get a bonus to their attack, the more the higher percentage of that stack that is killed over time. So in a big battle where they're taking a lot of casualties and a lot of losses are happening, they're still gonna, they're going to hit with bonus damage. Uh, so that is very cool. Two abilities here that kind of, um, you know, like I said, seem to come into play for those big battles. Mainly the revenge. Poisonous can be used. It uh, doesn't necessarily take a, uh, you know, a long drawn out battle to get the most out of poisonous. Uh, you know, if you're going against, let's say, uh, you know, rust dragons or something, you're trying to take over a rust dragon dwelling or you're attacking some rust dragons, you get them down to that last stack. Well, you could always, uh, you know, blind their last stack and just wait. Uh, don't engage with them until the poison runs its course. You know, if, if you can p blind them now and just defend for two rounds straight, let another 20% of their max health go down before engaging with them, go ahead and do that. Or if it's a slow unit and you can kite them, let's say, uh, you know, you hit them with a Haspid and you're quicker than them, if they're poisoned, just run away from them for two rounds and let the poison keep ticking up. There, there are little things that you can do uh, to take advantage of this special ability. You definitely want to look, uh, you know, to try to prioritize certain units. Not everyone is, uh, you know, can be affected by poison. Most can. Um, but um, yeah, def definitely you, uh, it's a good idea to try to attack units that aren't poisoned and you want to try to poison as many enemy stacks as you can. Uh, so all things uh, considered, we'll look back over them. Uh, they do have great attack. That is very nice. Low defense. Okay. They have very solid damage with a very high ceiling. Like I said, a bless really brings the best out of them. Uh, yeah, they kind of have the lower defense, but at least they have that 300 hit points there. 
that is very nice. Their speed ain't bad. 12 speed really isn't bad. They can get across the map. They're not really going to be going first in most battles, but they have good mobility. Um, so that is not the worst thing. Uh, cost, pretty standard, uh, pretty standard. And then, of course, their special abilities are good. Um, it's just their moment to shine, especially the revenge is kind of few and far between. Uh, but when their moment comes to shine, it's very, very potent, but it just, these special abilities maybe don't have their moment as often as you'd like. The 10th unit we're going to talk about today is the juggernaut, which of course is the second level seven unit in the most recent faction and that is the factory faction which at the time of recording has been out for a little over six months so let's go ahead and talk about these guys here if we look at the chart they have 23 attack and 23 defense uh, a little below average they're in seventh place on attack and sixth place on defense they're not bad not great below average uh, when it comes to their damage they're very solid so they're tied for third place, second, you know, only behind the uh, Titan and the Archangel with 50 average damage. These guys have 45 average damage, so pretty good damage there. And then they do have the high end 300 hit points. That is very nice, my friends. And then when it comes to speed, they are tied for last with the Chaos Hydra at that seven speed. They're more of a slower lumbering unit compared to its level seven counterparts. Um, you know, they have similar speed or the same speed as a Naga Queen. That's kind of a, a good creature to compare it to. So not the greatest speed there. Uh, their growth is two on par with all of these guys, except of course the Phoenix. And their cost is that standard price of 4,002 of a precious resource. Uh, I will say one thing about uh, fa uh, Factory is both of their uh, level seven units do require crystal. Um, so that can kind of factor into the price, but I'd say they're both fairly priced. You know, this is pretty standard. Um, and then their special abilities, they are mechanical. So mechanical is a whole new class of creature that was introduced with the factory faction in Heroes 3 Horn of the Abyss. And essentially, uh, they're another version of non-living. So there's a couple of different types of units that fall in the non-living category. And um, that is, you know, the golems elementals, gargoyles, and mechanical units. And so essentially they have a, a bunch of uh, immunities to certain spells and also to certain creature abilities. So the big one here is you can't resurrect them. So that's definitely not good. Uh, but I will say that brings me, uh, there is a way to resurrect them. And that comes from the level two unit in the factory faction. So the level two unit here is the mechanic and the engineer. And they have a special ability that's similar to the Archangel's ability to resurrect. So these guys can prepare or use their repair ability once per battle, just like a stack of Archangels can use their resurrection once per battle. And for each mechanic you have, they will repair 10 hit points. And for each engineer you have in a stack, it's 20 hit points per engineer. And they can repair mechanical creatures. And so mechanical creatures are... The, of course, level 7 units here of the Dreadnought and Juggernaut, who we are talking about. And then also their level 4 unit, the Automaton and the Sentinel Automaton, are the other mechanical units. Uh, so essentially, these guys can be resurrected, uh, but it's got to be from a level 2 unit. So if you want to have Juggernauts, or you know Dreadnoughts and Juggernauts in your army, oftentimes you're going to want to reserve a spot for a level 2 unit, which sometimes isn't ideal. Uh, you know, and have them around. Of course, you can do the same strategy with uh, Archangels where, you know, these guys use their repair ability and then you clone them. Then the clone can use their repair ability and then you kill the clone and then next round clone them again and you can keep, uh, you know, uh, resurrecting, so to speak, your mechanical units that way. It's just, it's not as clean as uh, just being able to resurrect the guys. I'm not a big fan of it uh, personally, uh, but continuing on, of course, can't animate dead them. Can't do destroying dead, no sacrifice. They are immune to a number of spells. Uh, so the of course, berserk, blind, forgetfulness, they don't shoot anyway. Frenzy, hypnotize, mirth, sorrow. So mechanical units are not affected uh, by morale either. Um, so that's another thing to keep in mind. But they're uh, you know unfazed by 
Azuri Dragon's Fear, you know, this aging ability, Death Stare, you can't summon demons from them, the Life Drain, they can't be poisoned, they can't have the disease, and then of course the Horn of the Abyss, its ability to, uh, you know, raise fang arms from fallen stacks, it does not work on mechanical units either. Uh, so a little bit of a mixed bag, it has its pros and cons, it can come in handy. Uh, the biggest drawback to me is that resurrection, and there is a path to resurrect them, but it's just not the most convenient, not the cleanest. I don't want to rely and, you know, try to reserve a spot for, you know, a level two unit. Um, not, not ideal. Um, but then we get to the special ability, and it is, the next one is Heat Stroke. So this is a very, very cool special ability so you can use heat stroke uh every round if you'd like it's a it's an alternative attack so of course the juggernaut can walk up to a unit and then do its regular attack where it kind of just punches them but then you could alternatively do a heat stroke which you cannot walk and then do a heat stroke so you can only do heat stroke if you are stationary and what it is is essentially it's a big laser beam where you shoot this laser beam out in this kind of this fanning motion. And the best way for me to describe it is if you combined a breath attack with a Cerebris three-headed attack, except it also covers like a couple more hexes. So it covers a big area. And again, you can't move and use it. You have to use it while stationary, but it reaches a couple hexes out. Uh, they are not retaliated against when you do your heat stroke. So that's very nice. Uh, a problem with it, though, is you can hit your own units. So that is not ideal. So you have to be very careful uh, how you do your heat stroke, how you position it. You don't want to hit your own guys. Um, of course, whenever they get attacked, they do have their retaliatory attack each round. They just use their regular attack back. Um, so heat stroke's cool. These guys are pretty similar to a Chaos Hydra. A lot of times I'm seeing people... Uh, compare them to each other. They are very comparable, and I will uh, here in a little while uh, compare these guys directly in this video. Uh, but all things considered, looking back, they got a little bit below average attack defense. They got that uh, higher end uh, damage. They have that first place health. Their bottom of the barrel speed. Uh, their cost is pretty standard. They have the mechanical ability, which is and eh, not the greatest. And then they do have that really nice uh, heat stroke ability, which oftentimes can be very very clutch. So all in all, a pretty solid unit. The 11th unit we're going to talk about today is the Phoenix, which of course is the level 7 unit of the Conflux faction. So if we come on over to our chart here, they have 21 attack and 18 defense. So that's 8th place when it comes to attack, 11th place when it comes to defense. So they're towards the bottom of the pack when it comes to those stats. And then you get over to their damage and they are having, they have that low end 35 average damage. That is as low as average damage gets for any of these guys. So they are right there at the bottom of the pack there. And then same when it comes to their hit points, it is as low as it gets. So the bottom, towards the bottom on attack defense, bottom damage, bottom hit points, but you move to their speed. They are in first place in speed by a mile. They are three speed quicker than the next fastest unit on this list, and of, which of course is the Archangel. Uh, and the next fastest unit in the game is the Azuri Dragon with 19. So they have two more speed than the second fastest unit in the game. Uh, so just blazing fast, extremely fast. So that is very nice in the sense that you can almost guarantee that you're going to get first go in a battle. Uh, you know, barring artifacts like, you know, the Cape of Velocity, Ring of the Wayfarer, Necklace of Swiftness, things like that. Or if you're going against a Sir Mullich with plus two speed, and of course the terrain you're fighting on can affect speed as well. But generally, a Phoenix is going to comfortably give you first spell cast uh, in a battle, which can be extremely, extremely important. So that is very nice. So, hey, they're coming in first place there. And then also, they're in first place when it comes to the growth. So if you look at the standard growth for the, all these other guys are two, here they are three. Now, before Horn of the Abyss, the Phoenixes actually had four growth per week, which I'm glad the uh, Horn of the Abyss team did this. They nerfed it to where their base growth is equal with all of the other guys, all the other level seven units, but then they added an extra building to the Conflux Castle called the Vault of Ashes which is like a horde building. So you build it, and then it adds one Phoenix growth per week. So they reduced it to standard, and then 
gave you the option to buy a building to bump it up to that three. So they grow at 50% faster. Um, and then when it comes to cost, it is they're as cheap as any of these guys get. Uh, so 3,000 uh, gold and then one precious resource, in this case, mercury. So that is very nice. They're starting to look kind of shaky at first with bottom of the barrel here, bottom attack, bottom health. But then these next three, hey, as quick, quickest unit in the game, they have the best growth of any of these guys. They're the only ones with that high of growth, and it's as cheap as they come. So that is very nice. Of course, you do have more to afford, um, but still, they're as cheap as they come. So that is nice. Special abilities, they're flying, which is awesome for being that quick. They can get anywhere across the map with ease. That is very nice. Of course, breath attack, a very nice special ability. We've been over this with the black dragon and the gold dragon. Can be a double-edged sword. It attacks whoever you attack. It's also going to damage uh, whoever is in the hex behind it, whether it be friend or foe, and a good player is going to take advantage of this often, and it's going to be extremely rare that it ever backfires. So a good player is not going to have their phoenix attack a unit and just blatantly hit one of his allied troops behind it. They're just not going to do that. What's more common, but still uncommon for a good player, is if a uh, a you know you position your phoenixes in a certain spot to where then an enemy unit attacks them, draws out the retaliatory attack, you attack through them, and then you happen to have an allied unit on the other side of them. You learn to avoid that. You get better at positioning, and breath attack is wonderful. You're, you can oftentimes be hitting two enemy units at once, and you essentially eliminate the times where you accidentally hit your own guys. And then going on with their special abilities, they do have fire immunity. So they are immune to... Uh, all fire magic, whether it's uh, buffs, debuffs, damage, whatever. And all things considered, if you're going to be immune to any school of magic outright, fire magic is the one to be immune to. All in all, I'd say the pros outweigh the cons. If you look here, sure, you can't bloodlust them. Not a huge deal. They can't be cursed. That's nice. Uh, protection from fire doesn't matter. They are immune uh, to fire. Uh, magic error, yeah. They can't be blinded. That is wonderful. Of course, firewall, visions doesn't play here. Uh, fireball, you know, landmine, they fly. Uh, you know, they can't have misfortune cast on them. That's nice. They can't be affected by Armageddon, so you could incorporate some sort of Armageddon strategy with them. Uh, Berserk, uh, they cannot be berserk. That is very nice. Sure, you can't cast fire shield on them, and you can't frenzy them. But I'd say all in all, you are avoiding some of the big hitters. You are avoiding the blind. You're avoiding the berserk. Um, you are, I'd say, you're missing out on more debuffs and damaging spells than you're missing out on the buffs. Uh, so I'd say that definitely makes them stronger. Um, and then they have this rebirth ability, which of course is unique to the Phoenix. And essentially, once a stack of Phoenixes die, uh, they will be rebirthed. And the amount that will be rebirthed depends on how many uh, were in the stack. So essentially, each Phoenix has a 20% chance to resurrect itself. So in other words, is that as it puts here, um, a Phoenix will have 20% chance to raise one unit with rebirth ability. Three Phoenixes will have a 60% chance to raise one unit. And six Phoenixes will have 100% chance always to raise one unit, plus an extra 20% chance of raising a second. Uh, so it's kind of a, a range. Uh, so for pretty much every five Phoenixes you have that die, you're guaranteeing at least one Phoenix uh, that's going to be raised. So essentially, you know, 20% are going to be raised. Um, so that, that can be very nice. Uh, you know, it, it's really cool uh, if, you know, they die in a round and you've been relying on them to get first spell cast each round. They'll rebirth. Uh, the enemy has to, you know, focus another attack on them. Um, it's a, a, just a really nice uh, come from behind kind of ability. Uh, very neat. Nothing crazy, but it definitely is nice. It definitely helps them stick around longer and can really come in handy, especially to keep utilizing their speed for that first spell cast. So all things considered, like we've said, the attack defense not looking great, damage not look, looking good, hit points not looking good, but then from there it's looking phenomenal. Great speed, great growth, great cost with some really good special abilities. The 12th unit we're going to talk about today is the Titan, which of course belongs to the Tower faction. So we're going to go to our list, look these guys over. When it comes to their attack and defense, they have 24 of each. So they're at 6th place and 5th place, so they're above average, a little above average when it comes to those. As far as damage goes, they're in 1st place. They're tied with the Archangel for average damage at 50, and they actually have the highest 
ceiling of any of these guys at 60. So that is very nice. And then getting on over to their health points, they are at 300. So that is as good as it gets. That is very, very nice, my friends. And then we get to the speed. So they have 11 speed and uh, you know they're in ninth place. But I will say these are the only ranged units on this list. They're the only ranged level seven units and typically ranged units are not known for their speed. And to be candid, 11 speed, that is the fastest ranged unit in the game. The next fastest ranged unit, I think, is what the Enchanter, maybe the Sharpshooter. They have nine speed. Uh, so they're the quickest shooting unit in the game. I get that they're also the only level seven shooting unit. Um, so, but all things considered, for being a shooting unit, I don't really take away as much from them uh, because of that low speed. Um, and then as far as growth, they're standard, only second to the Phoenix there. And when it comes to cost, uh, they are the second most expensive. They come in 11th place. Uh, they cost five. They're the one of two that cost 5,000 gold, them and the Archangel. And then these guys cost two gems, whereas opposed to Archangels cost one extra gem. So they're second to last. So they are pricey. Uh, you know, getting the, the, the tower faction as a whole is a little pricey. A lot of prerequisites, um, you know, Giants, they're unupgraded version. They're essentially just potential wasted titans. You know, they don't shoot. Their stats aren't great. Their damage is good, but their health is not good. Um, so it's a little pricey. Can take a bit to get them going, uh, and they are expensive. Uh, but so far, the stats are looking good. You seems to be you're getting what you pay for. Um, and then if we look here, of course, they are ranged. Like I said, they do have 24 shots, which is nice. Um, Another thing to point out about ranged units is, you know, these guys have a really high ceiling when it comes to damage, like really high, arguably the highest, you know, maybe not the Ancient Behemoth with their ignoring targets defense. It could be situational though, um, but they have the highest ceiling here for 60. Um, you know, if you have archery on your hero, that increases ranged damage by 50%, whereas offense just increases melee damage by 30%. So that helps. And then there are artifacts such as the, uh, you know, bow of the sharpshooter and its composite uh, component parts that increase your archery skill. Uh, there is no such artifacts to increase your offense skill. Uh, so these guys do have a really, really high ceiling. I mean, if you get them on a hero with archery and bow of the sharpshooter, you're going to just add their ceiling is just very high. You know, it's not that common that you happen to be in a game like that, but I've had plenty and they can absolutely be devastating. So uh, you know, that's just kind of one thing about them being the only ranged uh, unit on this list. They definitely have the high ceiling combined with their high uh, max damage. And then speaking of being a ranged unit, it's great that they have no melee penalty. So typically um, ranged units, when they're forced to use their melee attack, they attack with reduced damage, not Titans. They still hit for their full amount of damage. Um when they're doing their melee attacks so that is nice and of course range units do have going back to the range special ability of course they do have you know obstacle penalty and range penalty things like that that's also something to consider um but anyways so then also they have immunity to mind spells which is a very very good uh uh, uh special ability to have all things considered so i feel as though they're missing out on uh more uh bad spells than they are missing out on like beneficial spells uh, so they can be berserked, which is great. They can be blinded, which is great. What's huge is as a ranged unit, they can't have forgetfulness cast on them. So that is very nice. But then on the flip side, they can't have frenzy be cast on them, which of course, if you have them protected on the other side of the map as a ranged unit, keep them out of harm's way, a frenzy could be pretty darn good. Uh, they can't be hypnotized, not a big deal. Uh, they are affected by morale, but they cannot have their morale boosted through mirth. But... They also can't have their morale crippled through sorrow. Of course, if you have the orb of vulnerability on, that would take those away. Um, so uh, all in all, I'd say this strengthens them, especially being a ranged unit and that forgetfulness there. Uh, I do really like that immunity to mind spells special ability on them. And then they have the whole hates black dragons. So what black dragons hate them, they hit each other instead of hitting each other at 100% damage, they hit each other at 150% base damage. So just does a little 50% uh, increase to their base damage when they attack each other. Nothing crazy. Uh, but looking back here, they got 
a slight a middle of the pack, just above average attack and defense, first place damage, first place hit points, solid speed, especially considering they're the quickest ranged unit in the game. They are pricey. They are a little hard to get going, um, but they have a very, very high ceiling with some nice special abilities, especially for being a ranged unit. All in all, a very, very good level seven unit. All right, everybody, we have come to the final moment, the moment of truth, the moment to actually start putting these guys in their respective spots first through 12th. But before I do, I kind of want to divide these guys up into three different categories and rate them within those categories. And I feel like that'll kind of clear our thoughts and make things uh, just move a little more smoothly, if you will. So the three categories we're going to rank these guys in or put these guys in to begin with are the speedy flying units and then the slow lumbering units. And then, of course, the Titans are going to be in a little class of their own, uh, being the only ranged unit. So if we come here, we can go ahead and look at uh, the units we got here. We'll grab all of the speedy flying guys, throw them there, and then we will grab the slow lumbering units and put them there. So we're going to actually rank these guys in order, then these guys in order, and then we'll start picking away at putting them in their proper space. So the first thing we're going to do is we'll start with the slow uh, kind of lumbering units, and let's take a look at the Chaos Hydra and the Juggernaut. Very, very comparable units. Oftentimes, uh, you know, everyone's kind of said that the, uh, you know, the Juggernaut is just the new Chaos Hydra. Um, if you look here, of course, the Juggernaut has them beat on um, attack and defense, has them beat on average damage, has them beat on hit points. They're tied on speed. They both kind of have that AOE, um, uh, you know, splash ability, attacking a lot of creatures around them. Uh, of course, uh, juggernauts are a little more expensive and then so it really comes down to the special abilities here and what I'm going to say is that the chaos hydra is better than the juggernaut and my reason for believing so is one despite the juggernaut having better attack defense despite them having better average damage despite them having better hit points um, it's the special abilities so these guys are mechanical, and like I said, they are immune to a lot of things. You know, you don't have to worry about morale. Um, you know, they can't be berserked or blinded. Of course, you can get the orb of vulnerability and expose them to some of that. Um, but it's just, when it comes down to it, the resurrection. A good player is going to really, really look to use resurrection, and it can be a pain in the butt to try to rely on mechanics and engineers in your army to try to keep a stack of them, a relevant stack of them, and then find a spot for them in your army. You'd oftentimes look to replace, you know, uh, a level two unit in an end game army. Uh, but you have to, if you're, it's almost like if you want to put juggernauts in your army, you almost have to try to incorporate some of them. If you're in a map where you're anticipating losses happening, which of course, if a good player, uh, you know, is trying to make it challenging, uh, they're going to be playing on impossible. Usually they're going to be at a disadvantage in artifacts, primary stats, uh, army strength, things like that most of the game. And uh, you, it's really nice to be able to resurrect them. And it's just a little bit of a pain in the ass. So that makes me want to edge out the Chaos Hydra. Also, you can say the Heat Stroke is comparable to the attack all adjacent enemies. I like the Hydras all day, every day. So first of all, the Chaos Hydras can move and use theirs. Uh, the Chaos Hydra never ever hits any of its own units and also the chaos hydra its retaliatory attack will hit all enemy units around it whereas when the juggernaut is attacked they just do their single target retaliatory attack back um and it's very nice because a lot of times the ai will sometimes literally just move their unit away like a hex out of range of a chaos hydra because the AI doesn't want to attack the Chaos Hydra, invoke a retaliatory attack that not only hits the attacking unit, but then it hits some other uh, units that happen to be around it. Uh, so it kind of throw off the AI a little bit too. It's just, it has its unit or its moment to shine more. It's more consistent, never hits its own guys. They do it on retaliatory attacks. They never have uh, enemy retaliation. These guys, if they move and attack the one target, they do. Uh, I think these guys are just way more smooth. They can be resurrected, and that ability is just more consistent, despite their stats not quite being as good. Um, so 
that's where we're going to have them. So then let's go ahead and take the ancient behemoth. You know, where are we going to put them in relation to the chaos hydra and the juggernaut? Well, we're just going to go ahead and put them in the rightful place. They are better than the chaos hydra and the juggernaut. You know, if we look here at them, we've been over it despite the low attack defense. Uh, let's say, you know, lower attack, average damage, that ignore 80% of targets defense just makes them slap like no one else. In fact, my most recent playthrough, I think was a map Aeton Nomire, and there is a part, I can't remember which part, but I think the thumbnails like some ancient behemoths against some arch devils. Just watch that battle. Those uh they there are long stretches of a game where your ancient behemoths are going to be the only unit that is not only going to hit at a huge uh advantage a huge boost in damage but all your other units are going to be hitting at a reduced damage like there's going to be a long stretch of the game where you are lagging behind on not only army strength but primary stats as well and your units all of them are always going to be hitting at that reduced damage but then you can have ancient behemoths who are not only not hitting at reduced damage but at a huge increase bonus to damage and the difference is just shocking uh, you know, I, I will oftentimes base strategy solely around them, and I know I'm not basing uh, these guys on going against them, but there are times where I just have to avoid them like the plague. I cannot let my units get touched, certain units, any unit get touched by a fat stack of ancient behemoths. I got to look to uh, to avoid taking a big blow. It just goes to show how crazy good that special ability is. Um, and then, of course, the solid hit points despite the low defense there. Yeah, they're slower. Uh, but they are quicker than the the Hydra and the Juggernaut. I'm definitely going to put them the best there. And so then we have the Haspid. So I have a little bit of hangups with the Haspid. Uh, you know, they have great attack. They have a high ceiling. They got some solid speed dis despite, you know, not flying, not being a speedy flying unit. They're the quickest of what you would call the slow lumbering units. <sighs> I, I just really what what makes these slower lumbering units good compared to their peers is their special abilities. They're slow, they don't fly. How do they make up for it? Special abilities. And their special abilities can be absolutely awesome. Like when it comes to a battle where you know it's gonna be a lot of rounds, there's gonna be a lot of casualties, you freaking want Haspids on your team, for sure. But do you really want to you know, rely on that? How many of those can you have in a game before your army's gone? You know, how many casualties can your Haspids take you know, uh, before they're no longer relevant. Uh, so their revenge ability definitely has its moment, but at the cost of loss, I mean, you could, you know, maybe resurrect them towards the end of battle. Uh, poisonous can be good even at beginning stages of the game, but it's nowhere compared to the heat stroke or the attacking all adjacent enemies or the ignore 80% of targets defense. It's really just their lackluster special abilities compared to their friends, but I will say they do hit hard. They have great attack, solid speed, solid health, solid damage. I do put them above the Juggernaut, especially because they can be resurrected. That mechanical is really throwing me off, but I am not going to put them above the Chaos Hydra. I am going to put them there in third place when it comes to the slow lumbering units. Again, a good player knows how to take advantage of a Chaos Hydra. Their ceiling is a little bit higher than their ceiling, in my opinion. Okay, and I've been playing this almost 25 years when it comes to playing against the AI. Um, uh, you know, when it comes to having these guys on your team, I would definitely rather have Chaos Hydras than Haspids. So, of course, I would rather have to fight someone with Chaos Hydras than fight someone with Haspids. But, again, this is ranking them based off a good player utilizing these guys, a good player getting the most out of these guys. So, that is what I'm going to have here for these four units. Um, so. Uh, now we can go ahead and get into the speedy flying units. So I think the most comparable we have here is the black dragon and the gold dragon. And I think it's going to go without saying that the black dragon is going to edge out the gold dragon. So they're very comparable, you know, gold dragon, they have same damage. Gold dragon has two more attack defense, but 50 and one more speed, but 50 less hit points. If it was just down to these stats here, I would take the 50 extra hit points to reduce my speed by one and my attack and defense by two, uh, all things considered. And then, of course, they have the same cost, uh, essentially the same special abilities, except, like I talked about, 
man, I'm already not a fan of the magic community. I'd rather have the orb of vulnerability. Um, and then the one through four spell immunity is worse than just overall one through five spell immunity. It really, really bugs me. So I'm definitely, definitely going to have the black dragon above the gold dragon. And then we'll go ahead and get into just the rest of the dragons here. If we look, the ghost dragon, they're definitely going to be less than each of these guys. Pitiful attack defense, almost bottom of the barrel damage, worst hit points, the slowest of all the speedy flying units. That undead, uh, aging's inconsistent, can be nice, but they just leave a lot to be desired. They're not very threatening, and they're kind of hit or miss. Uh, one, whether or not their aging ability will work, and two, whether or not they really have a place in your army. Um, so the next unit we're going to go ahead and talk about is the Archdevil. So where are we going to put the Archdevil in this area here? Well, I'm going to go ahead and just straight up say they're definitely better than the Ghost Dragon. You know, if you look here, the Ghost Dragon compared to the Archdevil, oops, um, blows them out of the water on stats. Slightly worse when it comes to damage. Hit points are the same. Way better speed. Yeah, they are a lot more expensive. But that no enemy retaliation, that is just consistent. The minus two enemy luck, I get it's consistent. Just as consistent as, uh, you know, the minus one morale. But you're not getting the morale penalty from having undead. Um, I'd say that the Archdevil definitely, definitely... Um, outperforms the Ghost Dragon. And then if we look, are we then going to move them up beyond the Gold Dragon? I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say the Archdevil is better than the Gold Dragon. You can resurrect and cast spells consistently. You don't have to rely on an Orb of Vulnerability to um, you know, do what you need to do, cast what you need to cast on your Archdevils. Now, I will say, if you took away the level 1 through 4 spell immunity... I'd probably edge out the Gold Dragon above the Archdevil. Um, so, of course, if you can get an Orb of Vulnerability, that could change things, but that's a big if. Um, their stats, you know, pretty comparable here. They have one more defense, one less attack. Yeah, they got some extra damage and extra health. They have the one more speed. They are more expensive, but again, the no enemy retaliation, that nice aura of minus two enemy luck. I'm going to go ahead and give it to the Archdevil. Now, does the Archdevil outdo the Black Dragon? No, it is not. It is not. That speedy flying at 300 health, that's hard to pass up. Yeah, it's a little bit better on the stats. It's, it's uh, you know, of course, magic immunity isn't ideal, but it definitely has a very, very high ceiling. And even with, at least, at least you're not going to get blast with that implosion. And you could, uh, I know we're just ranking the upgraded versions. You could roll around with just red dragons till you get that orb of vulnerability. You could do the same with gold dragons and just roll around with green dragons until you get the orb of vulnerability and cast your resurrection. Um, but I am going to put uh, arch devils above gold dragons, but not above black dragons. Uh, I think that just they're too tanky uh, of a unit to do that. And uh, so we have, let's see, yep, we have them right like this. So far, it's black dragons, arch devils, gold dragons, ghost dragons. And then the next unit we have here is the Crimson Coatl. So if we look, do they pass up the Gold Dragon? Or I'm sorry, the Ghost Dragon. And I'm going to go ahead and say they do. They have a little bit better attack defense, slightly worse damage, same hit points, one extra speed. They're only 500 more gold. Uh, you know, you don't have to worry about that morale penalty. The aging's not consistent, at least the meditation without skipping a turn. Yeah, you can only do it once per battle, but it's consistent. It's reliable. Um, and the whole undead complication, all things considered, I'd rather mess with Crimson Coatles than Ghost Dragons. Now, if we come here, do the Crimson Coatles, do they take on the Gold Dragons? I'm going to say no. I think the Crimson Coatl uh, does not pass them. I mean, it's got six less attack and defense, a good chunk less damage, uh, less health, uh, less speed, slightly more affordable. Uh, and despite their big chink in the armor of that one through four spell immunity, which drives me nuts, um, you know, I, I, I just have to give it to the gold dragon based on stats. And also, if you do get that orb of vulnerability, it's just, and you can roll around, like I said, with green dragons and resurrect them until you find an orb of vulnerability or feel comfortable with gold dragons. Um, so we're going to go ahead and have them pass the ghost dragons, but not the gold dragons. And then, of course, obviously not the black dragons or the arch devils uh, then we're going to go ahead and rank the arch angels so where they're going to go as to no surprise 
I'm just going to tell you, they're going to go first throughout all these guys. They're better than the Black Dragon. Um, you know, if you look here, 30 attack defense compared to their 25. Better consistent damage. Yeah, 50 less health. They do have three more speed. They are pricey, uh, but just that great resurrection ability, that nice morale. Uh, you know, even if you had the Orb of Vulnerability on Black Dragons, I'd still take Archangels. Even if that magic community was gone, I'd still take them. Um, they are just too well rounded. They're just too good. Great stats, top tier stats in every category. Uh, you could the biggest thing you could say is they're pricey and you know their health isn't 300, but it's 250 with great stats, great damage, and just some awesome special abilities that really open up a lot of doors. They are the best in these. And then where does the Phoenix fit in? So I am going to just go ahead and put the Phoenix where I believe it belongs. And that is going to be between the Archdevil and between the Black Dragon. And the reason I'm putting them there is because they are uh, they're unique in a couple of categories. I mean, if you look at the first half here, their stats suck. Their damage sucks. Their attack defense not good. Their health's bottom of the barrel. I mean, it's they'd be worse than them, worse than them. They're getting comparable to, you know, a Crimson Coatl. Uh, you know, if you look on the stats here, they have more stats, same damage. You know, when it comes to these first four, they're pretty comparable to Crimson Coatl. Crimson Coatl, but then their speed. Their speed is the best in the game. Um, you know, and their growth. They can really snowball. You can find yourself getting a large stack of them, a larger stack of them typically than most other level seven units because of their growth. Um, also, that, that speed is just a sec it's hard to beat, guys. It's, it can be very, very, very important to ensure yourself a first spell cast. Uh, maybe you have, you know, the armor of the damned, or you have the iron fist of the ogre, and you want to get your buffs off first. You want to get that first spell cast. You want to get that berserk going. Something. It, it's just, it eliminates all fear, all doubt. I mean, obviously artifacts can come into play, but oftentimes an enemy unit can have phoenixes, and you're going to need phoenixes to ensure that first spell cast. And the reason they're going up as high as they are is because simply the importance of getting that first spell cast when it comes to those big battles. And also their extra growth helps keep make up for their stats. And then they have some really nice special abilities here. Breath attack is always nice. The fire immunity is cool and the rebirth, definitely a nice icing, uh, you know, cherry on top as well. Um, so just, they're a little hard to kind of compare them. They're a little bit different, uh, but I am going to put them in third place when it comes to the speedy flying units. And then of course, Titans. They are in a league of their own. So this is how I'd rank them when it comes to uh, their specific classes. Uh, you know, first to last, first to last. And so now, obviously, the first place slot is going to be one of these three. And I'm going to just go ahead and give credit where credit's due, guys. Archangels are the best in the game. Vast majority of people would agree with this. I see some people saying, you know, black dragons or whatnot. They're just, you get what you pay for. The only real thing you can say about them is they're expensive. You get what you freaking pay for. Um, you know, if you know how to use that resurrection ability with a clone, especially, it is just game changing. That morale is just so nice. Just they're such solid units. They're just too good to pass up. And then when it comes to second place, guys, it's obviously one of these three. And this is when we're going to breach or reach into the slow lumbering units, guys. Ancient Behemoths. They're the second best level 7 unit in this game. Why? Because they slap like no one else slaps. And not only that, but they will slap hard when none of your other units are slapping hard at all. Like your units are going to be hitting like weak little kittens, whereas your Ancient Behemoths are still going to just be slapping hard. Um, there are oftentimes games where, you know, you have no real threat if it wasn't for having a nice stack of ancient behemoths or you don't even stand a chance or have a strategy against this stronger enemy hero that you have to be a tactician you have to be smart you have to use your skill and your strategy to do they're, they're just a, a kind of a secret weapon they're an exploit they're uh, something you can look to base a strategy around and there are just many stretches of many games to where they're going to touch and hit like no one else can in the game 
and they tend they're cheap you tend to get them early they tend to snowball the ai doesn't really tend to target them very much i found just from experience it's pretty easy to come across a big stack to snowball a big stack of ancient behemoths and man man can they be brutal you know especially if you can clone them just mm, bless them guys uh they just hit too hard they are the best single target attacking unit in the game and that is why i have to put them in second place despite despite being slower and not flying i put them in number two here mm. i'll drink a water and so now when it comes to third place who am i going to put let's go ahead and get these guys just kind of down here if you don't mind and the next spot, guys, we are going to give it to the, let's see, oops, no, I think I, yeah, that's where we had it. So it's not going to be the Chaos Hydra. So now it's either going to be the Black Dragon or it's going to be the Titan. And this one is really tough. I went back and forth on this many times. You know, if you had the Orb of Vulnerability, these guys could arguably, their ceiling could put them maybe in second. <sighs> This is one of the most difficult ones I had to do. And if you wanted to have, you know, these guys at third, these guys at fourth, or vice versa, I couldn't blame you. But I'm going to go ahead and have to give it to the Titan. I get that it takes a while to, you know, it can take a while to get the Cloud Temple, and then you have to upgrade them, and they're expensive. But at least the path to their ceiling is pretty straightforward, whereas the path to a Black Dragon ceiling, you have to get that Aura of Vulnerability. Um... I just, I feel like they're just very, very vulnerable. They're great on paper, but they're just very vulnerable. A good player wants to be able to cast the spells on them and would take the risk of those debuffs and damaging spells. You want to be able to resurrect them. It is huge. It is absolutely huge. Um, and so because of that, I am going to edge out the Titan. You know, if you look here, they uh, Titans just have one less attack defense. They have better damage. Um, they have the same hit points. Yeah, they're slower, but they're a ranged unit. They're more expensive. Uh, they have great special abilities. Yeah, they hate each other too. Look at that. But all in all, I'm going to slightly, slightly edge out the Titan here. The only ranged unit. They have that very high ceiling, with high damage. You can get some artifacts that mitigate their range penalty. You know, bow the sharpshooter. Holy crap. Archery really helps a lot too. They just have a really high ceiling. Yeah, they can take a bit to get going and, and get them up expensive, get them upgraded and whatnot, but their high ceiling puts them above the Black Dragon here. So, of course, then the Black Dragon's going to get into fourth place, the only speedy flying unit with 300 hit points, just solid attack defense, solid damage, great hit points for speedy flying, solid speed for speedy flying unit. Uh, cost normal is just that, that magic immunity really is the only kind of blip on their resume, if you will. Um, so we're going to go ahead and put the Black Dragons there in fourth place. So now, the next unit we're going to do is obviously either going to be the Chaos Hider or it's going to be the Phoenix, and it's going to be the Phoenix. Um, again, for the same logic as to why they're better than you know the Arch Devils and Gold Dragons, um, even though their attack defense is not great, their damage sucks, their health is low, it's that speed. The importance of getting that first spell cast uh, you almost always want to reserve a spot. They always have a place in an army when it comes to really uh, difficult maps, big maps. Uh, oftentimes, enemies will have them in their army. You need them for the speed. You want to try to get a big stack of them. Their growth is great. They're cheap, pretty easy to come by. Um, and then they just have solid special abilities. Take advantage of that breath attack. The fire immunity uh, you know, is, it, it pays off in your favor 99, you know, 95% of the time. Uh, the rebirth is a nice little cherry on top. Just like solid special abilities, you just you just want a spot for them. They're just always in demand. Uh, more time, more games than not, you're going to want to have that 21 speed in your army. So, all right. So now, obviously, it's either got to be the Arch Devil or the Chaos Hydra. And of course, hey, it's the battle here. The only two units that have no enemy retaliation. And this is where I think my pick will get controversial. And I think that the Arch Devils have a much higher floor. Chaos Hiders have a very, very low floor. If you don't know what you're doing with them, it's low. It's, it's very low. They're not going to seem great. They're not going to be fun. You're not going to be able to take advantage of them. 
but a good player who can make the most out of these guys, the Chaos Hydra's ceiling is higher than the Arch Devil's ceiling. I'm going to put in sixth place, believe it or not, the Chaos Hydra. And I think it's a no-brainer. I feel very good about this pick. I just see so many picks online where the Arch or the Chaos Hydra is in like last or second to last. And I, I don't get it. I don't get it at all. Uh, Fortress is one of my favorite factions. I love Chaos Hiders. I play with them a lot. I know how to make the best out of them. They deserve this spot in sixth place. And again, this is playing against the AI, and this is under the guise of having these units on your team. And, uh, you know, it's very common in battles that these guys are hitting two units at a time. It's very common. And it's not uncommon at all that you can hit three units at a time. Um, now, it, hitting four units plus is a little more rare. I'll give it that. Um, but you're attacking two and three units almost as much, if not more, than you're hitting one unit at a time. And again, look to get water magic. Water magic is just incredibly important. Even if you don't start as fortress, uh, you know, water magic is just a very good ability to have. And if you have that expert teleport, you can put them over castle walls. You can put them in that spot where they're going to hit those three, those four people. And I mean, think about it. If you're hitting four units at once, like imagine a, you know, a phoenix, you know, or a, you know, a haspid gets to go four times in a row. I mean, three times in a row over a course of a battle they can do a ton of damage and yes their stats are kind of low you know you can mitigate it with bless here uh their lower damage and i will say typically you know if you're playing as fortress and if you then also have um the uh, mighty gorgons chaos hiders do a great job cleaning up those you know mid-level lower level guys they can meet them uh, in the middle of the battlefield, hit multiple of them at a time. They will have better base attack and defense than them. And then the special ability of the mighty Gorgon, the Death Stare. It doesn't matter if you're a peasant, if you're an Azuri dragon, if your attack and defense is a thousand, if it's zero, it's just killing units. Uh, you know, the, those guys are, uh, the mighty Gorgons are more or less your level seven killers. The Chaos Hydra, yeah, you can say their attack and defense is low relative to their peers, but they tend to kind of duke it out with the lower level creatures anyways um so and uh, as far as the arch devil why they beat them out they're they're just freaking pricey and they're a little squishy for my liking they're just a little too squishy despite having no enemy retaliation i like their aura that's great they're quick they fly around of course no enemy retaliation like i said is great but i just i don't like their bottom of the barrel damage and bottom of the barrel hit points and they are just freaking expensive I, they're overpriced. I'm not a big fan of that. So I am going to edge out the Chaos Hydra here uh, over the Arch Devil. And then, of course, I am going to put now, I'm not going to put the Arch Devil above the Haspid. Arch Devil is going to be next. They're just more consistent. Like I said, the Haspid's time to really shine. It's few and far between. They are a pretty good, just straight up single target damage dealer with decent speed. Um, but Arch Devil's quicker than no enemy retaliation, that overall aura. They just have more of a presence on the battlefield than a Haspid does. And then next, are we going to do the Haspid or are we going to do the Gold Dragon? Let's move these guys down. Um, we're going to go ahead and do the Gold Dragon. And we're going to do it because <sighs> on paper, they're great. I mean, 27 attack defense, great damage, solid hit points, solid speed. It's like, ah, oh, what's not to like? Well, it's this. The one through four spell immunity, that's not the like. Of course, the breath attack helps. Just, they they are good, especially if you get that orb of vulnerability. Man, they are great. It's just, to reach their ceiling is, can be inconsistent. Um, you know, I really, really don't like it. I've had a lot of games where uh, they kind of get dwindled down in numbers because you can't resurrect them. You're able to resurrect all your other guys. Oh, you lost a few gold dragons here, a few there. You could have resurrected them. You know, I'm, I'm likely to keep them as green dragons, so I can resurrect them. It just, mm. good player looks to resurrect. A good player is always looking to resurrect. And the fact that you can't cast the spells on it, eh. mm. not, not, yeah, it really bugs me. So, but again, great stats, pretty good ceiling if you do get that orb of vulnerability. So I am going to edge it out above the rest of these guys. Uh, the next unit we're going to put on here is going to be the Haspid over the Crimson Coatl. Um, so if we look here, it just, I mean, yeah, it's got one less defense, but it has eight more attack, way better damage, 
50% more health. Uh, yeah, they fly, so what? Uh, you know, they don't. Solid speed, though, for a ground unit. A little more expensive, um, but just these guys are just beefier, and they hit harder, uh, and their special ability is, you know, yeah, it's consistent, but you use it, and then it's over for a round. Uh, you know, whereas these guys, man, they can really have their moment to shine. And the poison ability, like I said, you can make use of it all throughout the game, but man, when it comes down to like attacking that last big important battle, or at least you have a big crucial battle at that point in the game, and there's still time to rebuild yourself. And it's, it's a battle where you can afford to, you know, have a lot of loss and a lot of casualties. You want Haspids on the battlefield. Um, they are just a solid unit. I do put them better, uh, uh, higher up than the Crimson Quaddle. They're just a little too squishy, a little unintimidating, and their special ability, it's there and then it's gone. Um, so we're going to move that there. And then who's better between the factory units? Um, this is a little tough, but I am going to have to give it to the Juggernaut above the Crimson Coaddle. And reason being, uh, you know, despite them not, you're not being able to resurrect them, yeah, you can do the mechanics and the engineers. It's just they hit hard, they're tanky, and they have that AoE damage. They're just more of a presence on the battlefield than these guys. They're just, they don't hit hard, they're squishy, they're fast, but they're not that fast. You know, 15 is not bad. And that special ability is just, like I said, it's there and then it's gone. You get one one round's use out of it, and then they're just kind of a kind of a squishier flying level seven unit. Uh, so you know, I I do give it to the Juggernaut above the Crimson Quaddle, and then of course, who does that naturally put in last place? Well, it's going to put the Ghost Dragon. We've already had the Ghost Dragon compared to the Crimson Quaddle and the Ghost Dragon. They are in last place. They are the worst. They are typically the worst. Uh, ranked level 7 unit, and for good reason. They're just very, they leave a lot to be desired, just bottom of the barrel and just about everything. And their special abilities can be good, but it's just so inconsistent. Uh, and the whole mixing with undead, it's meh. Uh, definitely last. So, again, I hope you guys have commented your list 1 through 12 uh, prior to watching this video. Um, and then maybe if I change your mind at all, or you have a different thing, uh, you want to switch around based off the information I present in this video. I totally like to hear your guys's input. Uh, let me know if one of these picks surprised you, if you think one of these picks are ridiculous, if there's something, you know, that I'm missing, but all things, guys, we got the archangel in first followed by the ancient behemoth, Titan, black dragon, Phoenix, chaos, Hydra, arch devil, gold dragon, Haspid, uh, juggernaut. Crimson Quaddle, and Ghost Dragon. So that is where we're going to rank each of these guys first through 12th.